The Visit, a tragic comedy. That's the Gudrun, Hamburg, Naples. The racing Roland, Venice, Stockholm, gets here at 1127. The only pleasure we have left, watching trains go by. Five years ago, the Gudrun and the racing Roland stopped in Golan. Also, the Diplomat and the Lorelei. Important express trains, all of them. World-class trains. Not even the local trains stop now. Just two from Kaffigen and 113 for Kalberstad. Ruined. The Wagner works kaput. Bachmann and Co. bankrupt. The Hopewell foundry shut down. Living on welfare. On soup kitchen handouts. Living, vegetating. Rotting away. The whole town. Sound of a passing train. The station master salutes. The men follow the train with a movement of their heads from left to right. The diplomat. And we used to be a cultural center. One of the foremost in Europe. One of the foremost in the country. In Europe. Goethe spent a night here, in the Golden Apostle. Brahms composed a quartet here. Bertolt Schwartz invented gunpowder here. And I was a brilliant student at the École des Beaux Arts. And what am I doing now? Sign painting. It's about time the millionaires got here. They say she founded a hospital in Kalberstadt. And the day nursery in Kaffigen and a memorial church in the capital. She had her portrait painted by Zint, the, that naturalist dabbler. She and her money. She owns Armenian oil, West, Western Railways. She owns Armenian oil, Western Railways the Northern Broadcasting Company, and the nightlife quarter of Bangkok. Gulen! The local train from Kaffigan. The bailiff. He's here to put a lion on the town hall. Now we're ruined politically too. Stand clear! Our distinguished guest will be arriving on the 113 local from Kalberstadt. We'll have the mixed choir singing. The youth club. And the fire bell ringing. It hasn't been pronged yet. The town band playing on the marketplace and the gymnastics club forming a pyramid in the honor of the billionaires. Of the billionaires. Then a banquet at the Golden Apostle. Unfortunately, we don't have the funds to illuminate the cathedral and the town hall for the evening. Good morning, Mayor. A very good morning to you. What are you doing here, bailiff? Your honor knows that already I'm faced with a colossal task. Just try putting a lion on an entire town. Except for an old typewriter. You won't find a thing in the town hall. Your honor is forgetting the Golan Historical Museum. Sold off to America three years ago. Our treasury is empty. No one is paying taxes. That calls for an investigation. The country is flourishing, and Golan with its Hopewell foundry goes bankrupt. We're baffled ourselves. It's an economic enigma. Bet you the Freemasons rigged the whole thing. It's a Jewish plot. I think big business is behind it. International communism is pulling the strings. Bell rings. I always find something. Got eyes like a hawk. I'll have a look at the treasury. Bet he fleeces us now. Then after the millionaires arrives... The painter has finished painting the sign. That, of course, just won't work, Your Honor. These words are too informal. Welcome Claire Zakanasian, is what it should say. But she's Clary, Clary Vasher, born and bred here. Her father was a built-in contractor. So I'll just write, Welcome Claire Zakanasian, on the back. Then, once the billionaire is touched, we can still show her the front. It's the stock marketeer, Zurich Hamburg. A new express train passes from right to left. Always on time. You can set your watch by it. Oh, please. Who still wears a watch in this place? Gentlemen, the billionaires is our only hope. Except for God. Except for God. But he won't pay. He's forgotten us. Fourth man spits. You used to be friendly with her. Ill. So everything depends on you. But then their ways parted. I heard some vague story 
Do you have a confession to make to your pastor? We were the best of friends, young and impetuous. After all, gentlemen, I was a young fellow 45 years ago, and she, Clara, I can still see her shining through the dark on her way to meet me in Peterson's barn or walking barefoot on moss and leaves through the woods of Conradswale, with her red hair streaming behind her, slender, supple, delicate. What a ravishing little witch. It was life that separated us. Nothing but life. That's how it goes. I should have some details about Mrs. Zakanasian for my little speech at the banquet in the Golden Apostle. Takes a small notebook from his pocket. I went through the old school records. Clara Vasher's grades were, most unfortunately, very poor. So was her conduct. Her only passing grade was in botany and zoology. Good. Passed in botany and zoology. That's good. I can help you here, your honor. Clara loved injustice. No doubt about it. One day they were arresting a bum. She threw rocks at the police. Love of justice. Not bad. Always make an impression. But we better drop that bit about the police. She was charitable, too. Whatever she had, she shared. She stole potatoes from a poor wi- for a poor widow. A charitable disposition. This gentleman I must definitely include. It's the main issue. Does anyone remember anything her father built? That would, that would be worth mentioning. Nobody. They say he was a drunk. His wife left him. Died in a madhouse. For my part, I'm ready. The rest is up to ill. I know. Get Zakanasian to cough up her millions. Millions. You've got the right idea. Exactly. A nursery school just isn't enough. My dear ill, you've been the most popular personality in Golan for a long time. I will be retiring in the spring. I made contact with the opposition. We've agreed to nominate you as my successor. But, your honor, I can only confirm this. Gentlemen, back to business. I will first talk to Claire about our miserable situation, but carefully, sensitively. We have to be smart about this. Strike the right psychological note. If we botch the welcome at the station, that alone could jinx the whole thing. The town band and the mixed choir just isn't enough. It was right. This is an important moment, after all. Mrs. Zakanasian sets foot on her native soil. She's found her way home, is moved, tears in her eyes. She sees the old familiar sights. I, of course, won't be standing here in my shirt sleeves like this. I'll be wearing a formal black suit with a top hat, my wife beside me, my two grandchildren in front of me, all in white, with roses. My God, I hope it all falls into place at the right time. The Racing Roland. Venice, Stockholm, 1127. 1127, we still have nearly two hours to put on our Sunday best. Kuhn hoists the Welcome Claire Zakanasian banner, together with Hauser. The others should preferably wave their hats, but please, no shouting like last year for the government commission. The impact amounted to zero, and to this day we have not received the subsidy. Excessive high spirits are out of place here. The occasion calls for an inward joy, close to sobbing, heartfelt sympathy with this child of our town who has returned to us. Be natural, be sincere. But don't slip up on the timing. Make sure the firebell goes off right after the mixed choir. And above all, the express! Stopping! In Golan! The most poverty-stricken, lousiest, pathetic dump on the Venice-Stockholm route. The laws of nature have been suspended. The racing Roland is supposed to show up as it comes around the bend at Lutenau. Zoom past here. And vanish again as a dark dot in Pukenheide Valley. Am I in Gillen? Madam, you pulled the emergency brake. I always pull the emergency brake. I protest vigorously. In this count in this country, you don't pull the emergency brake, not even in an emergency. Staying on schedule is our first principle. May I request an explanation? This is Gillen, Moby. I recognize the pathetic little dump. Over there are the woods of Conradsweil with the brook. 
where you can go fishing, trout, and pike. And that roof on the right is Peterson's barn. Clara, it's Zakanasian. Zakanasian. And the mixed choir isn't ready. The youth club. The gymnasts. The fire department. The sexton. My frock coat, for God's sake. My top hat. My grandchildren. Clary Vosher's here. Clary Vosher's here. Don't forget my wife. I'm waiting for an explanation, officially, in the name of the railway authorities. You're a blockhead. I'm here to pay this little town a visit. Do you expect me to jump off your express train at full speed? Madam, if you wish to visit the town of Golan, please, the 1240 local from Kalberstad is at your service, at everyone's service, arrival in Golan, 1.30 p.m. You mean the local that stops in Lurken, Brunhebel, Beisenbach, and Lutenau? You really expect me to go off puffing around the countryside for half an hour? Madam, this will cost you dearly. Give him a thousand, Bogby. A thousand. Madam, and three thousand for the railway widow's relief fund. Three thousand. There is no such relief fund, madam. madam. Then start one. Madam is Madame Claire Zakanasian? Oh, I beg your pardon. That is a different matter, of course. We certainly would have stopped in Gulen if we'd had the faintest idea. Here's your money back, madam. Four thousand. My God. Four thousand. Keep it. It's nothing. Keep it. Would madam prefer the racing Roland to wait while she visits in Gulen? The railway management would gladly comply. The portal of the cathedral is said to be remarkable, gothic, with the last judgment. Just zoom off, you and your train. But the media, sweetie, the media people didn't get off yet. The reporters have no idea. They're dining up in front of the dining car. Let them dine, Moby. I don't need the media in Golan just yet. They'll come soon enough. Stand clear. I sincerely hope Madam does not complain to the railway management. It was a pure misunderstanding. Dear Madam Zakanasian, as mayor of Golan, it is my honor to welcome you, a child of our town. Thank you, mayor, for your beautiful speech. Clara, Alfred, how nice that you came. It's something I always plan to do, all my life, ever since I left Golan. That's sweet of you. You thought about me too? Of course, always. You know I did, Clara. It was a wonderful time, all the days we spent together. You bet. You see, my dear teacher, I've got her in the bag. Call me what you always used to call me, my little wildcat. And what else? My little sorceress. I called you my black panther. I still am. Nonsense. You've gotten fat and gray and you look like a drunk. But you've remained the same, my little sorceress. Oh, phooey. I've gotten old too and fat and my left leg is gone. A car accident. Now I only travel in express trains. But the artificial one is quite something, don't you think? It moves nicely. I would never have guessed my little wildcat. May I introduce you to my seventh husband, Alfred? He owns tobacco plantations. We're happily married. Oh, certainly. Come, Moby. Make a bow. Actually, his new real name is Pedro, but Moby sounds better. Also, it goes well with Bobby, my butler's name. Butlers are with you for life, so my husbands have to adapt their names to his. Isn't he cute with his, last, with his black mustache? Think, Moby. Harder. Even harder. But I can't think any harder than that, Buttercup, really. Sure you can. Just try. You see? It worked. He looks almost demonic this way, doesn't he, Alfred? Like a Brazilian. But he isn't at all. He's Greek Orthodox. His father was Russian. We were married by a Greek Orthodox priest. Fascinating. Now I'm going to have to look around Gölen. My father built this public convenience, Moby. Good work, precisely executed. As a child, I used to sit on the roof for hours, spitting, but only on the men. 
Madam, as headmaster of Golan High School and lover of the noble muse of music, may I take the liberty of offering you a simple folk song presented by the mixed choir and the youth club? Shoot, teacher, let's hear a simple folk song. The fire bell. They were supposed to sound the fire bell. Well sung, Goliners, especially that blonde bass on the left with the big Adam's apple was remarkable. Officer Hanke, madam, at your surface. Thanks. I don't intend to arrest anyone, but perhaps Golan will have need of you. Do you sometimes turn a blind eye? I do, madam. How else could I get by and go on? Might as well shut both your eyes from now on. That's my Clara, my little sorceress. My grandchildren, madam. Hermione and Adolphine. Only my wife is missing. Congrats on your brats, Mayor. There. Our pastor, madam. Ah, uh, the pastor. Do you comfort the dying? I try to. Does that include people who have been sentenced to death? The death sentence has been abolished in our country, madam. It could be reintroduced. Dr. Nuslin, our physician. Interesting. Do you prepare death certificates? Death certificates? When someone loses his life? Yes, I do. Next time you determine the cause of death, call it a heart attack. My little wildcat. What hilarious jokes you make. Now I want to go into town. Mayor, do you really expect me to hike for miles with my artificial leg? Right away, right away. Dr. Nuslin has a car. A 1932 Mercedes, madam. No need. Since my accident, I only move around in a seat and chair. Roby and Toby, go and get it. Two gangsters from Manhattan, sentenced to die in the electric chair at Sing Sing, released at my request to, to carry my sedan chair. One million dollars per petition is what it cost me. The sedan chair comes from the Louvre, a gift from the French president. A nice gentleman. Looks like he does in the papers. Carry me into town. Roby and Toby. Yes, ma'am. But first the, to Peterson's barn, and then to the woods of Conradsville. I want to visit our old trysting places with Alfred. In the meantime... Take the luggage and the coffin to the Golden Apostle. The coffin? I brought one along. I may need it. Go ahead, Roby and Toby. At last! The fireball! We're in Gullen! We can smell it! We can smell it! We can smell the air! We can smell it in the air! The Gullen air! And who are you? We belong to the old lady. We belong to the old lady. She calls us Kobe and Lobi. Madame Zakanasian is lodging at the Golden Apostle. We are blind. We are blind. Blind? Then I'll take care of... Then I'll take the two of you there. Thank you, Mr. Policeman. Thank you very much. How do you know I'm a policeman if you're blind? By the tone of your voice. By the tone of your voice. All policemen have the same tone of voice. You seem to, ha to have had some dealings with the police, you little fat men. Men! He thinks we're men! If you're not men, what the hell are you? You'll figure it out. You'll figure it out. Well, at least you're always cheerful. We get cutlets and ham every day. Every day. I do a little jig for that, too. Come on, give me your hands. Funny sense of humor they've got, foreigners. Off to Bobby and Moby. Off to Roby and Toby. Suitcases. Nothing but suitcases. Loads of them. And a while ago, they carried a panther upstairs in a cage. A wild black beast. The coffin goes to a room of its own. Strange. World-famous ladies have their whims. Pretty chambermaids. It seems she plans to stay a while. So much the better. Ill has her in the bag. His little wildcat. His little sorceress, he called her. He'll get millions out of her. To your health, sir. To the chance that Claire Zakanasian will put Bachman and Co. back on its feet again. The Wagner works. The Hopewell Foundry. Once that gets going, everything else will. Our community, our high school, our standard of living. For more than two decades, I've been correcting our students' Latin and Greek exercises, Your Honor. But in this past hour, I have learned the true meaning of horror. Seeing that old lady stepping out of the train in her black rose made my, my hair stand on end. Like one of the fates, like an avenue 
like an avenging goddess. Her name should be Clotho, not Claire. I could well imagine her spinning the web of destiny. Pull up a chair, officer. It's not much fun working in this dump, but now new life will sprout from the ruin. I've just been to Peterson's barn with the billionaires and the shopkeeper ill, a touching scene, both of them standing all solemn, like in a church, embarrassing for me to watch them. So I stayed away when they went to the woods of Konradsvir, a regular procession, two fat blind men in front with the butler, the sedan, then the sedan chair, and behind it, ill and her seven husbands, and her seventh husband with his fishing gear. She's a man eater, a second lice. We are all sinners. I wonder what they're after in the woods of Conradsville. The same as in Peterson's barn, Your Honor. They're visiting the local lights with their passion once. What's the word? Burned. Blazed is more like it. it reminds one of Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet, gentlemen. I am deeply stirred. For the first time in Gullen, I feel the greatness of antiquity. Above all, let us drink to our good friend Ill, who is doing everything he possibly can to improve our lot. Gentlemen, to our most popular citizen, to my successor. More suitcases. What a lot of luggage. We are pine trees, hawthorn, oaks. We are beech and spruce and willow. Moss and lichen, ivy thickets, undergrowth and fox's lair, German woodlands, wild profusion, drifting clouds and cries of birds, timid deer and magic mushrooms, whispering branches, ancient dreams. The woods of Conrad's whale, Roby and Toby, stop for a moment. Stop, Roby and Toby, stop, Boby and Moby. The heart with our names, Alfred, yours and mine, almost faded away and the letters have moved apart. The tree has grown. Its trunk, its branches have grown heavier, like our bodies. German woodland, it's been a long time since I walked through the woods of my mouth, tramping through the leaves, through the purple ivy. You two go chew your gum behind those bushes and take the sedan chair with you. I'm tired of your faces. And you, Moby, go wander over to that brook on the right. You'll find your fish there. Look, a deer. It's the close season. We kissed on this boulder. More than 45 years ago, we made love under these bushes, under this beech tree, among toadstools on the moss. I was 17 and you weren't quite 20. Then you married Matilda Blumhard with her general store and I married old Zakanasian with his billions from Armenia. He found me in a Hamburg brothel. It was my red hair that attracted him to me, that golden old June bug. Clara, a Henry Clay Bobby. A Henry Clay! A Henry Clay! I enjoy cigars. I suppose I should smoke my husband's, but I don't trust him. It was for your sake I married Matilda Blumhard. She had money. You were young and beautiful. The future belonged to you. I wanted your happiness. So I had to renounce my own. Now the future has come. If you had stayed there, you would have been as ruined as I am. You're ruined? A bankrupt shopkeeper in a bankrupt town. Now I have money. I have been living in hell since you left me. And I have become hell itself. It's a constant fight with my family. Every day, they blame me for being poor. Little Matilda didn't make you happy. The main thing is, is that you're happy. Your children? No sense of ideals. Don't worry, that'll come. I'm leading a ridiculous life. I never even managed to really leave this town. One trip to Berlin and another to Tessin. That's all. Why bother anyway? I know the world. Because you could always travel. Because I own it. Now everything will be different. Definitely. You're going to help us. I won't abandon the town of my youth. We need millions. That's not much. My little wild cat. That hurts! You hit one of the hinges on my artificial leg. A woodpecker. It's just like it was when we were young and bold, when we were walking out of the woods in Conradsville, in the days of our love, the sun high above the pines, a bright disk, drifting cloud banks in the distance, and the cry of cuckoo somewhere in the woody wilderness. Cuckoo! Cuckoo! Cool wood and wind in the branches, roaring and sighing like surf on the beach, 
just like it used to be, just like it was. I wish time were suspended, my little sorceress. If only life hadn't torn us apart. You wish that? Just that, nothing else. You know I love you. The same cool white hand. You're wrong. Another prosthesis. Ivory. Clara, is everything about your artificial? Almost from a plane crash in Afghanistan, I was the only one who crawled out of the wreckage. I'm indestructible. 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 The storm of applause was for you, my dear lady. It's for the town band mayor. They blow their instruments very well indeed, and the gymnasts' club made a beautiful pyramid before. I love men in undershirts and short pants. They look so natural. Do another exercise. Swing your arms back, young man, and then do some push-ups. Marvelous muscles. Have you ever used your strengths to strangle someone? Strangle? What a golden sense of humor Clara has. Her jokes just kill me. I don't know. I find them rather chilling. May I escort you to the table? My wife. Annie Dummermutt, top of our class. Little Matilda Blumhard, I remember you lurking behind the shop door on the lookout for Alfred. You've grown skinny and pale, my dear. She's promised millions. Millions? Millions. Incredible. Now I'm hungry, Mayor. We're just waiting for your husband, madam. No need to wait. He's fishing, and I'm getting a divorce. A divorce? Moby will be surprised, too. I'm marrying a German film star. But you said your marriage was a happy one. Every one of my marriages is happy, but it was the dream of my youth to be wed to the Gullum Cathedral, and the dreams of one's youth must be realized. It's, it'll be a most solemn occasion. Dear madam, my dear fellow Gulliners, it was 45 years ago that you left our little town, founded by the Elector Hasso of the Noble, so pleasantly esconced between the woods of Conradsville and Pukenreit Valley. 45 years, more than four decades, a lot of time. Much has happened since, many bitter events. The world has taken a sad turn, and so have we. And yet we have never forgotten you, dear madam, our Clary. Nor have we forgotten your family, your splendid mother, so robust and healthy, so deeply fulfilled by her marriage, and, but, alas, her premature, prematurely torn from our midst, your father, truly a man of the people, who erected a building next to the station that attracts large numbers of laymen and experts alike, visitors, that is, both your parents still live on in our money, in our memory as the best, the most worthy amongst us. And above all, you, my dear lady, frolicking through our streets as a blonde, red-head tomboy, streets that today are, alas, in such sad disrepair. Was there anyone who did not know you? Even then, everyone could sense the charm of your personality, could sense your eventual rise to the dizzying heights of humanity. You have remained unforgettable. Truly, your academic achievements are still held up as an example by our educators, especially the interest you showed in the most important subject, botany and zoology, thus expressing your sympathy with every living being, indeed, with all creatures in need of protection. Even then, your love of justice and your charitable nature were widely admired. Was it not our Clary who obtained food for her poor old widow by purchasing potatoes with pocket money she had earned by working for neighbors, thus saving the life of an old woman who would otherwise have died of hunger, to mention just one of her errands of mercy? Dear madam, dear gulliners, the tender seeds of these promising instincts have now come to full bloom. Our little redhead tomboy has turned into a lady whose charity embraces the whole world. We need only think of her social welfare endowments, her maternity homes and soup kitchens, her art foundations and kindergartens. And so I want to call out to our beloved prodigal daughter who at last has found her way home. Hurrah! 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 Mayor Gulliners, I am touched by your unselfish display of joy over my visit. As a matter of fact, I was a rather different child from the one described in the mayor's speech. I was beaten in school, and I stole those potatoes for the widow ball, together with ill, not to save an old panderer from dying of hunger, 
but just to have a chance for once to lie with ill in a bed where it was more comfortable than in the woods of Conradsville on Peterson's barn. But as my contribution to your joy, I want to tell you right now that I am prepared to give Gerlin a present of one billion, five hundred million to the town and five hundred million divided among all families. One billion. On one condition. That's Clara. Pure gold. Wonderful. She's a riot. My little sorceress through and through. On one condition, you said, dear madam. May I ask, on what condition? I will tell you the condition. I will give you a billion. And with that billion, I will buy myself justice. What exactly do you mean by that, madam? I mean what I said. But justice can't be bought. Everything can be bought. I still don't understand. Step far forward, Bobby. I don't know if any of you still recognize me. Chief Justice Hofer. Correct, Chief Justice Hofer. Forty-five years ago, I was Chief, Ju Chief Justice of Gerland and then moved on to the Court of Appeal in Kaffigan. Until twenty-five years ago, Mrs. Akanasian offered me the opportunity to enter her service as her butler. I accepted. A peculiar career for a man of learning, perhaps, but the salary was so fantastic. Get to the point, Bobby. As you have heard, Mrs. Claire Zakanasian is offering a billion and one's justice in return. In other words, Mrs. Claire Zakanasian is offering a billion provided you make amends for the wrong that was done to Mrs. Zakanasian and Gurlin. Mr. Ill, if you please. What do you want from me? Step forward, Mr. Ill. All right. The year was 1910. I was Chief Justice in Gölin and had a paternity claim to arbitrate. Claire Zakanasian, Clara Vasher at the time, charged you with being the father of her child. You denied paternity, Mr. Ill. You had brought along two witnesses. This happened long ago. I was young and headless. Toby and Roby, bring in Kobe and Loby. At your service, at your service. Do you recognize these two, Mr. Ill? We are Kobe and Loby. We are Kobe and Loby. I don't know them. We have changed. We have changed. Say your names. Jacob Duckling. Jacob Duckling. Walter Perch. Walter Perch. Well, Mr. Ill, I know nothing about them. Jacob Duckling. Walter Perch. Do you know Mr. Ill? We are blind. We are blind. Do you know him by his voice? By his voice. By his voice. In 1910, I was the judge and you were the witness. What did you swear, Walter Perch and Jacob Duckling, before the court in Gölen? That we had slept with Clara, that we had slept with Clara. That's what you swore before me, before the court, before God. Was this the truth? We swore falsely, we swore falsely. Why, Walter Perch and Jacob Duckling? Ill bribed us, ill bribed us. Ill bribed us, ill bribed us. With what? With a quart of schnapps. With a quart of schnapps. Now tell them what I did with you, Kobe and Roby. Tell them. The lady tracked us down. The lady tracked us down. That's right. Claire Zakanasian tracked you down. Sent out search parties for all of you all over the world. Jacob Duckling had immigrated to Canada. Walter perched to Australia. But she found you. And what did she do with you then? She gave us to Toby and Roby. She gave us to Toby and Roby. And what did Toby and Roby do to you? Castrated and blinded us. Castrated and blinded us. That's the story. A judge. A defendant. Two false witnesses. A miscarriage of justice in the year 1910. Is that not so, plaintiff? Ancient history. It's just like an old story. What happened to the child, plaintiff? It lived for a year. What happened to you? I became a prostitute. Why? The court's verdict turned me into one. And now you want justice, Claire Zakanasian? I can afford justice. One billion for Gerlin, if someone kills Alfred Ill. Freddy! My little sorceress, you can't ask for that. Life has gone on since then. Life has gone on, but I have forgotten nothing, Ill. Neither the woods of Conradsville nor Peterson's barn. Neither Widow Ball's bedroom nor your treachery. Now we have grown old, the two of us. You down at the heels, and me cut to pieces by surgeons' knives. And now I want us both to settle account. You chose your life and forced me into mine. You wanted time to be suspended, 
just a moment ago, in the woods of our youth, so full of impermanence. Now I have suspended it, and now I want justice, justice for a billion. Mrs. Akanasian, we're still in Europe. We're not savages yet. In the name of the town of Gölen, I reject your offer. In the name of humanity, we would rather be poor than have blood on our hands. I can wait. End of Act 1 The Visit by Friedrich Dürrenmatt